Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for all that are gathered here today, those who are in the church and those who are in the Zoom land who, is also, who are also participating today. I ask that the words of God will be articulated in a way that will cause them to grow and develop to the full stature of Christ Jesus. Give me supernatural recall of your word. There's no flesh my glory in your sight. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. We started a message uh, last week, I believe it was. No, two weeks ago. Somewhere in that, uh, this is actually part three that we're going to be going into today. Being properly armed to win every battle against the enemy. Being properly armed to win every battle against the enemy. Thank God for that scripture and the, the content that has been declared already. We're going to just continue where we left off uh, from last week. How many of you were here last week? Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord expects we who are believers to understand that the afflictions we are encountering, are you encountering any kind of afflictions? Mm -hmm. Y'all doing good. <laughs> so if we encounter any afflictions in our life, it's uh, to give us an experience by uh, that the fact that all believers are going to be going through different challenges, not just you. And I think we ended on that note last time that we are to endure the afflictions with the growth from the negative experiences and obtain the victory that the Lord intended for us to obtain from it. One of the primary ploys used by the enemy is to convince we who are believers that we are the only one that ever, and uh, that very few believers are experiencing the same difficulties uh, we are facing. And even the great prophet Elijah went through the same steps. He was duped by a lie from the because the scripture says the following about him when he was going through his ordeal in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse 14 through 15. Great prophets, strong people in the things of God also go through challenges. And all of them are pretty much the same, just the different variations. But uh, they, the same kind of challenges that he went through, uh, we're going to go through today. And he had to be uh, reminded by the Lord that the challenges that the others that are there with him are going through the same similar challenges as he was in his confrontation with the people who lived in the land. First Kings 19 and 14 through 15. Then he said, his, the prophet Elijah, the great prophet of God, I have been very zealous for the Lord God. Have you been zealous for the Lord doing the things of God? I mean, tired out with the work of the ministry. And that's what he's saying here. Because the children of Israel have forsaken. He said, the reason why I'm having to do so much work is because the children of Israel, Israel have forsaken you. They have forsaken your covenants, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. And with the sword, I alone am the only one that is left. And they seek to kill me and take my life also, as they've done with others. It sounds like something that we, some of us would say today. Now, usually we don't have to worry about our lives. Although the direction that this country is going, you don't know what's going to happen in the next few years. You know, the politicians seem like they've lost their minds, some of them, and the people along with them. So hopefully we just need to pray and trust the Lord that we can have a peaceable life. The Bible says we should, we should pray for the leaders of our land that our lives might be peaceable. That doesn't mean we agree with them. It's just that we're going to make they, sure they make the right decisions that are not going to make it an onerous life to live, you know, because of hatred and all of the other things that the devil can cook up. And the Lord rebuked the prophet uh, Elijah for believing that he, and only he, was a believer that was alive in Israel at that time, although it appeared that way. First Kings 19 and 18, the Lord is speaking back to him, responding to his impulse to believe that he's the only one left. Yet I have, the Lord saying, yet I have left for me, this is the Lord speaking back to uh, Elijah, the great prophet of God, 7,000 in Israel. Now, you know, you're not the only one. There's 7,000 people in Israel, all the knees of whom have not bowed into Baal. Baal was an idol god that people were worshiping at that time. And he's in the midst of his encounter and a challenge from Baal to determine if people are going to serve the, the Jehovah God or whether they're going to serve Baal. And many have made their choice that they're going to serve Baal. And every mouth which have not kissed him. So the images that people carried around, he's referring to as the image of Baal that they carried around and they kissed. And he's making him sure that uh, Elijah understood that the seven people, 7,000 people in Israel didn't kiss his emblem. 
and did not bow down to him, so that he was not the only one remaining. So uh, look at the final verse in Peter's exhortation, which we left off at the last time. We who believe it today are also uh, admonished to realize we're not the only ones going through difficulties and challenges. First Peter, the fifth chapter and the tenth verse. But the God of all grace, Peter is referring to the Lord God, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Notice this. We don't like this, but it's in the scripture. First Peter 5 and 10, the latter part of that verse. After that we have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, sell you. It's something the Lord tucked that in there. After you have what? How many of y'all like to suffer? Funny how people just skirt through that one. It says, no, I don't want any suffering. I want all the blessings and the bounties that go along with being a child of God. The Lord said that after you've gone through some suffering for a while, he's going to make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and he's going to sell you as a result of that. Encounters with enemy oppositions are the method the Lord has chosen to develop and mature us as believers. That's hard to believe sometimes, huh? As we look at the way that we feel through after adversity and challenges have uh, seem, seemingly left. Observe that the phrase, after that you have suffered a while, indicates that God has placed a time limit on how long we may suffer. That's interesting to know, huh? You I mean, I don't have to go through this forever. But it seems like in the last few months, I don't feel good about the things I'm encountering as a child of God. My prayers are not being answered as readily and speedily as I would desire. Have you ever said that? Mm -hmm. Just like the great prophet Elijah, that's what he's saying. That I'm having problems right now and we haven't gotten to the end of my challenge. Now, how long we will suffer is indicated that there is going to be a limit and God is the one that determines how long that's going to be. We're afflicted as believers. So that's good to know that there isn't going to come to an end, but only God, unless he reveals it to you, lets you know when the end is. The phrase, settle you, purpose for going through challenges to settle you. How many of y'all need to be settled? <laughs> Praise the Lord. At the end of the verse, it's captured my attention because I believe it is one of the primary elements that is missing in many believers' lives. Is the fact that many of us are not settled the way we should be. Settling the word, settling the Lord. When adversity comes and we say, where is God? Yeah. How quickly we respond say, where is God? Just like Elijah of old. Where are you, Lord? It seems as though I'm being overwhelmed. and Not very many people are embracing this Christian life. The word settle is from the Greek word, which means to settle, to lay a foundation, notice that, to ground, to cause one to become relaxed, determined, steadfast, and tenacious. That word tenacious means to be determined. In other words, to be determined. You know that God's going to get you through it, regardless of what the circumstances are depicting. Let us return to Ephesians chapter 6 and examine the next verse that's in there. There's a number of things that uh, are described that has to do with the armor of a child of God. And we're moving along pretty good, I think. Uh, and now it begins to address the particular components of our armor there in Ephesians 6 and 14. It says, Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. You've got to stand. Yes, and uh, keep your belt up. Praise God. <laughs> keep your pants up when enemies come against you. Don't be a coward soldier running, you know, discarding all of your armory as you're uh, fleeing from the enemy. The Amplified Version of the Bible says, having tight tightened the belt of truth. Isn't that something? Tighten the belt of truth. Praise the Lord. And having on uh, is a phrase which means to have put on the breastplate of righteousness. So you got to put on what those uh, uh, constructs are that we're supposed to have as our armory as a child of God. You got to put them on. You can talk about it, but you got to put them on to prepare yourself for an encounter with the enemy. Unbelievers have to put on the and uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, notice that breastplate of righteous, uh, right standing with God. 
the word loin is found in the verses from the Greek word oshus, and what it means is the hip. The loins is the hip. I had some problems with my hip in recent years. Have you ever had a problem with your hip hurting? Praise the Lord. Or hip area. It also uh, has to do with the internal uh, physiology. It refers to our sexual organs. So it goes beyond just the hip, it's the sexual organs. It means it has to do with our production. What are we going to produce as a believer? The organs of procreation. What are you going to procreate? The Lord wants us to produce something. Not just to look good with our armory on, but he wants us to do something as a result of having that armor there with that particular component of our body. The part of our anatomy that is used to produce children or offspring, figuratively, it pertains to our posterity. God's concerned about the offspring that comes out of you. I mean, it's not just you, but your offspring, what you're producing, referring to that which comes out of one's lineage, whether literally or figuratively. One example of this is the reference of Apostle Paul that he made to Levi, and the offspring of Abraham, saying the following. In uh, Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verses 9 through 10, Amplifying Version. A person might even say that Levi, the father of, this is Paul's talk, talking here, the father of the priestly tribe himself, who received tithes, the tenth, and paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his father. So the, the Paul went way back in time here, for some of you who are not familiar with it, and uh, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, a type of Christ Jesus, a type of the priest of God, a type of the, the one who is our priest, high priest of our confession today, is Jesus Christ, who is also referred to in Scripture as Melchizedek, uh, a foreshadowing of who, uh, he's, actually Melchizedek was a foreshadowing of who Christ would be when he came in his full uh, dimension as the high priest of our profession today. Did y'all know that? For he is still in the loins of Abraham, and even still, notice this, with the 10th verse. This is uh, Hebrews 7 and 10. For he was still in the loins of Abraham, his father, forefather Abraham. So this is talking about uh, Levi. He was in the four, he was still in the, the uh, the loins of his father had already been here. Abraham had come on the scene already. So one of the offspring, uh, part of his posterity, was Levi. You understand that? He came after uh, Abraham. When Melchizedek met him, uh, Abraham is what he's referring to here. When Melchizedek met him. You know, there was a war that went on back during the time of Abraham between he and some of the inhabitants of the land. And he ran into this fellow that people thought he was a type of God himself. And they called him Melchizedek. And so after he won the battle, because of the assistance of Melchizedek, he paid a tithe, excuse me, a tithe to him. And uh, that's what's being referred to here. The tithe that was paid by Abraham was actually a tithe because Levi was in the, his bowels, in his loins, had not been produced yet. It's as if Levi himself had paid the tithe. The tithe that he was going to pay had already been paid by his forefather. There's a message in here to us about tithing. It goes well beyond what people give the credit for. The implication that we are, who are believers are to ensure that that, that which is we, that we produce and the things which we do are governed and controlled by the belt of truth, the word of God, manifested by our discretion, foresight, and constraint. In the life that we live, the Lord Jesus made his, this statement in response to the fruit, referring to, in the metaphor, metaphorically speaking, about that which is to be produced from the lives of believers, just as uh, Levi, although he wasn't physically there, he was in the loins of Abraham when he paid tithes to Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek. And uh, the point I would make here is that as a principle that's being start, started here, I'm not going to preach the whole content of Hebrews, but tithing one is something that was established way back during the time of the, uh, preceding the law. And that's what the Lord is saying here if you read the whole chapter. But tithing is something that is in, 
that we're supposed to adhere to even today. And some people will say, I don't tithe anymore. And you say, why don't you tithe? Because that came out of the law. No, Abraham predated the law. So what he did back uh, before the law, when he paid tithes in Melchizedek, we're supposed to do the same thing today. There's no way in the world physically that Levi could pay the tithe. He was still in the bowels of, um, of Abraham, and similarly today. Uh, some principles are established by our forefathers that we're supposed to follow even today. So tithing is, has not been turned aside. So if uh, Melchizedek received tithes as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Father, then Jesus Christ is going to receive tithes as a type of Melchizedek in the day in which we live today. So we're not given really to a priest or an elder you know, in the church who says, well, all the tithes go to the church, all the tithes go to the pastor. A portion of the tithe does. But then we receive the tithes and supposed to give back a tenth of the tithe that we receive from the church. Y'all still with me here? And so I can't go into a deep uh, study of that today, but that's what we refer to today. One thing I want you to take away, tithing is before the law. Tithing was done by Melchizedek, by Abraham, by implication, because Abraham paid tithes through Melchizedek because Levi was in his bowels. He was also supposed to pay tithes when he came on the scene years later. You understand that? So tithing is predated by Melchizedek before the law, law of Moses, before the Levitical law. You understand that? So when the law was turned over, you have people just... It goes so contrary. When the law is turned over, we're now living under grace and truth. When that's turned aside, you turn aside tithing also. No, it didn't say that. A lot of things that go beyond what was happening during the time of the law of Moses that is still something that's in vogue today. That's as much as I'll say right now. You still with me here? Okay. Let's go back. You see. So the belt of truth, the word of God manifested by our discretion, foresight, a constraint in the life that we live is important. The Lord Jesus made a statement in respect to the fruit. Again, speaking metaphorically about that which is produced from the lives of people, whether they are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, or some other tree not planted by the Lord, saying the following. And... Uh, I'm going to go here. Let's go to Matthew 9, 12 and 33. Then I'm going to go back for the foundation scriptures and read them after I've read this. So in Matthew 12 and 33, either make the tree good, talking about the kind of person where he's treating us as trees of righteousness and trees of error. Make the tree good and his fruit good. So a tree, a child of God, should produce good fruit. Did you know that? Or, he, or make the tree corrupt. If it's producing corrupt fruit, then the tree is a corrupt tree. It's fruit. How many of you are eating rotten fruit off of a tree? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you, we were talking this morning. My wife went to the, uh, what do you call the market on Sunday? Farmer's market. market got some good fruit. I could taste it as I was eating it in my cereal. I said, I said to my wife, I said, I could taste the fruit, not just uh, the skin or whatever, but I could taste the flavor of the fruit, the essence of it. I said, this is really good. And uh, all of it tasted that way. And all, wherever she went, you need to go back there again because all of the fruit different, is about three or four different types. Uh, apricot and uh, I think peaches in there. And uh, uh, what was the other one, the red one? No, the one that Kimmy likes. What did you eat? The fruit you eat? No. Plums. It had some plums in there, and the plums were good. And usually, the plums don't have any flavor at all in most stores. The plums were even good. I said, man, this was good. So, I mean, whatever tree they got in front was a good tree. It wasn't a bad tree. That's what should come off of us. When people partake of the fruit that comes out of our loins, they should be inspired and lifted. And they should go to another whole level because of the experience that they've just gone through. So let me read it again, Matthew 12 and uh, 33. Make the tree good and its fruit good. And also make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. So whatever way the tree is, if it's a good tree, make it better. If it's corrupt, just let it be whatever it is. For the tree is known by its fruit. Now I want to go back to the origins of all of this. I think 
We need to read this to make sure you understand what the Bible thinks about it beyond just the New Testament. Uh, Isaiah 61 and 3. Here the Lord uh, is talking about that it might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. He's talking about, let me read it from the beginning here, because some of you may not, you can't just jump to a spot. Got to make a, let me read, okay, here we go. We can just go to, go to uh, Isaiah 60, uh, 61 and, and 3. Um, let me read the, the, the whole preceding verses. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he, the Lord, has anointed me to preach good tidings. He also preaches this again in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus speaking here. Good tidings unto the meek. Uh, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prisons to them that are bound. Notice this. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I'm going to go down to, uh, yeah, let's continue. And the day of vengeance that hasn't come yet of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, again, let's insert in the third chapter here. This is Proverbs 61 and 3. So the Lord Jesus is talking about the thing, the reason why he came on earth, you know, as the high priest of our profession, why he came as Jesus the Lord, okay, and now seated at the right hand of majesty on high, where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. These are the intercessions that he's going to make for us as we, we as human beings and we as believers. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Let's go to the third verse. The Lord Jesus said, he came to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. Zion is the uh, new Jer in Jerusalem, the holy place that God has set aside for believers, uh, the habitation of peace that we're supposed to live in, as a child of God today, although we're not physically in Jerusalem, we're supposed to act as though we're in Jerusalem, a peaceful place the Lord has set aside for us. Y'all with me here? To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion in the presence of the Lord. To give unto them, okay, those people who mourn, and sometimes we're going through challenges and problems that make us weep and mourn. Y'all ever done that? I'm a child of God, I don't know who I'm going through, all of this, Lord. You know, please help me, Lord. Recently, y'all have done that. Every single one of them, just yesterday, see? Because it's not just us, it's our whole family. You know, kids and all of them, too, the things happen to them. And then when you see it over, you say, Lord, I thank you, you were there, even though I wasn't there, but thank you for your right hand. Let me read this. To give unto them beauty fashion. So the Lord said, his purpose is for those who are mourning in Zion in the habitation of peace. Those who are in the things of God, who are living for the Lord, uh, I come here to them to give unto them beauty for ashes. See, they've been standing on the heap uh, of, uh, in, the, in the, what do they call the place you go to? Uh, where they burn, a cemetery where they, people burn bones and things of that nature. Huh? Crema? Yeah. yeah, but back in those days, they go to the dump. So in the dump, there's trash and things of that nature to burn. So when something terrible happened in their lives, they go on a, place, a hash, ash heap of trash and things of that nature, and they go sit on the ash heap to let them know, I'm sorry because something terrible and significant has happened in my life, and I don't, see, I don't have a authority over it. So I'm going to sit here and weep before the Lord. I'm going to sit on the ash heap. You know, and it's, I know it's still on fire. I'm going to be careful about the fire, but I'm going to sit right on top of the ash heap to let the Lord know that I've had, i suffered significant loss. Got it? Got it? Although I'm a child of God, I'm suffering significant loss. And that's been uh, demonstrated by the fact that I went to the, the, the dump where they burned bodies back in those days, bodies and all trash and all sorts of things, and uh, let you know that uh, I need you to come help me. Get me off of the ash heap and put me back where I'm supposed to be. You understand the context of that? Yes. Okay, let me go back to the verse here. Uh, Isaiah 61 and 3. Okay, the Lord said, the day of the vengeance and the what's going on? I appointed to them that morning Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes. He wants to take away your suffering. The, the ashes that are all on you, smear all over your face. People have washed their faces with the ash, which is black. 
you know, and make them look like, oh, I'm going through something terrible here. And I lost this and I lost the other and I shouldn't have lost nothing because I call myself a child of God. Lord, you got to come and help me right now. I don't feel like putting on nice clothes. I want to let you see how I feel inside in my spirit. So I think you all got that. Notice he said what he came to do is to give unto them, the ones who are going through that suffering, I want to give them beauty. I don't want them to look that way or act that way because they belong to me. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be part of the habitation of peace, but they're demonstrating the fact that uh, suffering and all those things, as though I'm not doing my job, as though I'm not going to clean them up, as though I'm not going to resolve the problem that they're mourning about. Y'all understand that? What I'm going to give them for what they're doing and what they should have understood before they started that, that, that the mourning and crying and weeping, uh, I'm going to give them the oil of joy for mourning. So for my remedy is I'm going to give them oil to wipe on their faces, to cover them hair with their hair and all of that for the mourning that they're going through. Right? For ashes, that's what that means. The oil of joy for mourning. I want their disposition to change from one of ashes to one of joy, the oil of the Lord. The garment of praise, whatever they got on and then took off, I want them to put on the garment of praise. I'm going to make one available for them. Oil for their face, oil for their hair, and clothing that befits who they are as a child of God. Notice he calls them a garment of praise. Instead of them mourning and suffering, I'm going to replace that mourning with praise. Isn't that what the Lord does? Whatever the conditions we come. When you get saved, he pulls you off of the heat, the ash heat. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, and all the stuff that you've been going through, he comes and he replaces it with something that's joyful. The joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. strength. See, the devil wants to sap all your strength and all of your vitality. The Lord said, I'm here to, to oil you up real good, wash you up with nice, clean uh, garments, and, uh, and I want to be a garment of praise. Now I want you to celebrate me in the midst of the challenges that you're going through. It sounds like the Lord, huh? I know the challenge is still there, but I'm going to change it. Praise God, that's what I do. That change, condition changer is what the Lord is. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I don't want you heavy anymore. That you might be called. Notice, why is he doing all of this? That you might be called... Trees of righteousness. How many trees of righteousness do we have here? Trees of right standing with God. The planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Notice that. We're trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be what? Glorified. God wants to get glory out of our lives. That's why he answers, when you call unto the Lord, and he answers your prayer. You notice, if you abide in my word, where's that in... Uh, John 7, John 15 and 7. If you abide in my word and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will. And it shall be done. For by this the Father glorified that you bring forth much fruit. And in the 15th chapter of the book of John, one I quoted, he's talking about the, uh, the tree and the branch. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's talking about a branch. If you go, let's just go there real quick. Honestly, you got to tie these things together so they make sense. I'm just going to quickly read the 15th chapter of John. I'm going to read just a few verses. Well, I'm here already. That's pretty good, huh? Yeah, 15. I am the true vine. Jesus said, I'm a true vine. And my father is the husband man, the one who keeps things in shape. Right? The former. Let's go to the second verse. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit is taken away. And every branch that bear fruit, he purges it. He says, I'm going to let you go through some things because I want to make your fruit better. I'm going to cut off all of the dead limbs and things of that nature. And so that the product that comes off your tree is going to be beautiful and lush. That you may bring forth more fruit. Look at the third verse. Now, we are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. This is Jesus speaking. He said, you get cleaned up through the word. Get off the ash heap. You're cleaned up because I've shared with you the word of God. 
So you really should not be looking the way you look. Fourth verse. Abide in me and I in you. God abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Look at the sixth verse. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, the word I just quoted. If you abide in the seventh verse, and my words abide in you, this is your requirement. The Lord, ladies, this is on you. The word's got to, you got to abide, abide in what the word of God says, and the word of God has to stay in you. How many of y'all doing that? You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here is the Father glorified, that is, that you bear much fruit. When you get your prayers answered and produce much fruit, it brings glory to Father God. So shall you be my disciple. That's how you demonstrate that you're a disciple of God. Because your prayers at some point get answered. They always get answered. And you give a testimony of the goodness of God. The goodness of God draws men to what? Repentance. They come to repentance because they, they listen to you and you inspire them to go to the next level in Christ Jesus. And if you talk to them properly, let them know that this is where all children of God should be. In a position where we're constantly receiving the benefits of God. His blessings because of what we glorified him through getting through the challenges that he permits to come in our lives. Is that enough? Okay, let's go back to where we were. 63. Now, I'm going to read it again, but I'm going to go a little deeper. Yes, it's uh, Isaiah 61 and 3. He said, He appointed to them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes. He's showing what he, how he's going to replace that sullen state you're in. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We should look good as children of God. I mean, you shouldn't be down. We should get up after a few days when you got hurt or whatever. But we're still human. Some we need to get back up, perk up again, because God's a good God. And let people know he got you out of the circumstance. The government prays for the spirit of heaviness. That they might be called trees of right. We're supposed to be called trees of righteousness. Trees of right standing with God. The planting of the Lord. Lord has planted you. You should act like it. You're stable. You're rooting all everything that has to do with who you are as a tree. Praise God. Are beautiful. That you might be glorified. That he might be glorified. The Lord wants his glory out of our lives. Yeah. And uh, so let me just give you a little bit more detail. We're called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he might be glorified. Praise the Lord. And that word glorified that's there means if you look it up in the, in the Greek, it means uh, to gleam. The context of it is to shake the tree. Your tree's got to be shaken. By shaking your tree, the Lord gets glory. If you shake a tree, what happens to the fruit that's on it? It falls off, right? Praise the glory to the Lord. So, I mean, we're going through things and the Lord's going to allow our tree to be shaken. So we can see the results of the fruit that comes off of us when we go through adversity. Yeah. So it means to gleam. Glorify. And then you look at, you go to, just go to the Greek and look at that and see what it says for, because I was looking the other day, I never knew that. Glorify. The Father is glorified by what we go through, right? So then the, when you shake a tree, and I, and I thought about, I'm a tree of righteousness. But when I used to have trees, a whole bunch of fruit trees in my backyard coming from Bakersfield, of every kind, of every sort. But one thing I know is that when you shake the tree, the fruit falls off. And we shake the tree so we can get some of it, so we can eat it. Praise God. And uh, if it's not ripe, it, sometimes you can shake the tree, nothing comes off. There's not time for it to shake. But if it's ready to produce a crop, and you shake it, it easily falls off the fruit, so you can eat it. You can enjoy it. And so, 
Actually, the Lord wants to shake our tree. And if uh, the things that he wants to produce are not ready, he's going to leave it on the tree. Amen. But if the things that are on there, see, he's shaking your tree, that's all. <laughs> Let's see what kind of fruit comes off of your tree. You see, that if it's not ready to come off, it's not going to come off. But the things that uh, you've been cultivating for the Lord, the kingdom of God, praise God, righteous fruits going to fall off. Things that are going to be delighting to other people. People are eating your fruit from your tree. Isn't that good? In the Hebrew, uh, we've been planted uh, in the garden of the vineyard of the Lord. And that's demonstrated there in the 15th chapter of St. John. Jesus is a branch, we're the branches, and he's a tree, tree of righteousness. Praise the Lord. We're attached to him. And he expects us to produce good fruit. And he said, if you don't produce good fruit, he's going to cast you into a lake, a fire. So your tree's going to be shaken occasionally. And anticipate it. Living in life, it shakes your tree. How do you respond when your tree is shaken? Y'all got that? So let's go back to Matthew 12 and 33. Make the tree good, and its fruit good. Else make the tree corrupt, and the fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. So depending on who you attach to, you can't but produce good fruit. Fruit's going to always be good. And your tree is going to get shaken occasionally, when you least expect it. The Lord's expectation is that whenever he shakes your tree, the proper fruit's going to fall off of it. But the point is that you're going to go through some testing, and your tree's got to be shaken. So you say, what is this happening to me? Because the Lord just shook your tree. He wants to see what kind of fruit is going to fall, so others can be benefited by what God has done for you and through you. How many of y'all notice that? Yeah, I don't think the tree really likes that when you're shaking it. You, your peach tree just loaded down and you shake it. Yeah, some of it it wants to release, but most of it wants to retain because it's not the proper time for it to, re, to come out. Another encounter is going to allow the Lord to shake it again and it's going to pr- come to full fruition and it gets shaken the second time. Mo- your tree's going to get shaken multiple times until all the fruit's gone. Then the phase of development goes over again for the next season. Okay? Y'all with me? You got that? Praise the Lord, let's move on in here. The Lord's uh, concluding statement indicates that believers should be fruit inspectors. This is the reason the Lord Jesus said, now, now I'm saying some things here that people don't like, but we will be fruit inspectors. John 7 and 23, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So we have a right to judge other saints, and believers, and unbelievers. Lord, is this righteous judgment? Y'all got that? The Amplified Version of the Bible gives us more clarity in how we, the judging situations that we encounter when we deal with individuals. Uh, St. John 7 and 24. Be righteous in your judgment. And do not decide at a glance, superficially, by appearance, but judge fairly and righteously. So I can't judge you if I'm judging you properly. Okay. The implication is that every believer are to be fruit, are to inspect and indeed judge the works of other people. And if the fruit is corrupt, we should put up our guard and tread carefully in our dealings with that person. You understand that? If bad fruits come with people, leave them alone. And if the Lord has prompted you to get to him and say, get him saved and all of that, then do that. But if you're not ready for that, then you should leave him alone. Somebody else can go and get them into the kingdom of God. The works that people produce is corrupt sometimes. Not the fruit of one who is a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. 
that he might be glorified. We already read this. Isaiah 61 and 3b. We return to the verse we have been deciphering in Ephesians. Ephesians 6 and 14 and 18. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And the Amplified Version says, having tightened the belt of truth. Let me talk about this and then we'll let you go. Having on the phrase, the, uh, uh, the phrase having on is from a Greek word, inyo. From a Greek word, actually, in duo. Means to have put on the breastplate of righteousness. We've got to do that. In the latter part of the verse, the Apostle Paul instructs us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. In times of antiquity, the breastplate protected the heart and other vital organs that were in close to proximity uh, to the heart. If you're indeed a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, as declared by prophet Isaiah, you will already have put on the breastplate of righteousness. We should always have that on. The word righteousness is from the Greek word, which means, according to the Strong's, equity. It not only means righteousness, but it means equity of character and especially justification. So you mean you have to be equitable and you have to be justified before the Lord. But if you confess him as the Lord of your life and you live in the way you're supposed to bring it forth good fruit, you're justified. If you don't do that, you're not justified. You have to continue in the things of God. Got that? Unfortunately, many believers are not aware that this definition is not sufficient because it implies that God justifies us whether or not we live our lives in obedience to or in accordance with the word of God. There gives a more comprehensive understanding of the word righteousness. You've heard that before. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you can bridge that up, that up so quickly, huh? In all the places in which it's used in the Bible so that we can have a more accurate interpretation of its meaning, uh, and there really takes it to the next level. That's one of the Bible dictionary and lexicons. One's behavior is an integral part of whether or not one truly is righteous. Did you know that? I mean, that fruit is a fruit rotten. They can't say I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. If it, all the stuff they do that comes off of them is bad, it's not an implementary of who Christ Jesus is. So they're not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Instead of examining the places in the Word of God, where righteousness is used, especially in the New Testament, the Apostle John clarifies, y'all listen to me, we're going to, meaning of the word righteousness, stating that the fruit of one's behavior indicates whether one is truly righteous or not. First John, second chapter, verse 20. And now, little children, abide in me. Y'all see that? Lord Jesus speaking, St. John. No, actually, first John. Little children, abide in him, this is uh, John speaking, the Apostle John, that uh, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed um, before him. So if you do the right things, you won't be ashamed when the Lord comes to establish his kingdom. Let's go to the 29th verse. If we know that he is righteous, we know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. There's lexicon goes a step further. Do of righteousness uh, in the verse when it means it's to perform something worthy of a Christian. The implication is that there is a standard of behavior that should be exhibited in those who call themselves believers, those who are born again. The F5 version of the Bible expands the words of the Apostle John by giving us a greater definition in the following. And uh, I think I'm going to stop after this. First John 2 and 28 to 29, Amplified Version. Little children, abide, live, remain permanently in him, the Lord Jesus, so that when, we, when he is made visible, we may have and enjoy perfect confidence, boldness, assurance, and not be ashamed and shrink from him in his coming. 29th verse. If you know perceive and are sure that he is Christ, is absolutely righteous, uh, conforming to the Father's will, he will, he will in purpose 
thought and action, you may also know that he be sure that everyone who does righteously and is therefore in like manner conformed to the divine will is born and begotten of him, Father God. If you have confused, if confusion remains that Apostle Paul clears up the controversy that looms in the minds of many professed believers today, two script verses uh, should be remembered. James uh, 2 and 19, 17 and 18. I think this one will be the last one. Even so, faith is, if it hath not works, is dead, been alone. Many of you heard this. 18th verse, James 2 and 18, half brother of Jesus. Yea, man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me the work, the faith without thy works, and I will show you thee my faith by my works. Y'all see that? You gotta have works associated with the faith you say you have. You know, there's been a teaching going around today that indicates that you don't have to have any works of righteousness at all. It just comes automatically. And once you confess Jesus as Lord, you're automatically righteous. You stay righteous regardless of the kind of fruits that you produce. That's not true. It's contradicted by many of the scriptures we already read today. If good fruit doesn't come off of you, then you're corrupt. You're corrupt. You don't belong to the Lord. If good, if uh, if a bad fruit comes off of you, you're a corrupt person and you're not a child of God. So there's got to be a conforming element in your life that indicates you really do belong to the Lord, that you're serving him to the best of your ability, and the fruit that you produce is good fruit that is edible. God bless you. Go with God until the next time. Bonnie, I'm, I'm doing in other words, so I'm just going to give a, a quick overview of what was said and also from the previous weeks as well. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nutt, uh, <coughs> his message was called um, Being Properly Properly Armed to Win Every Battle Against the Enemy. It was part three. So... We are not excluded from suffering as a child of God. After suffering for a while, he will restore support and strengthen us, and he will place us on firm foundation. Uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We need to abide in him and he in us to pr produce much fruit. And God wants to shake our tree to get us in right standing for his glory. So even though we are human, we do not wage war like humans because we believe and trust in God. Um, the weapons of our warfare are not to defeat flesh and blood humans. Instead, our weapons have divine power from God to destroy strongholds and tear down the devil's obstacles to keep people from knowing the true and living God. Um, even though we do not fight against flesh and blood like the military, they have the same philosophy for a victorious outcome. The military trusts their leaders, hoping that they have their best interests in mind. We trust the Lord in his mighty power, knowing that he has our best interests at heart. So the military put on earthly armor and learn to master their weapons of warfare by training, practice, and guidance from their leaders. We put on the full armor of God, and we master our weapons of warfare by knowing and growing in the word of God and standing strong in it. God has blessed us with armor for us to resist the enemy, giving us the belt of truth, shoes of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. The military has strategic plans that work sometimes, but they do not have a sure thing like God's soldiers. Not only do we have God's armor, but we also equip with the power of prayer. I can agree with one thing that Reverend Ike used to say. He said, you can't lose with the stuff I use. 
So, <laughs> which I, uh, I take that to mean that you cannot lose if you have on the full armor of God and the power of praying in the spirit. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www.sjwoffcc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.